morning, everyone. Welcome to the Columbia Journalism School. I'm Sheila Coronel. I am Dean of Academic Affairs at the school. That means I'm in charge of curriculum and faculty. I'm also director of our investigative reporting specialization, um, the Stabil program. Is there anyone here, anyone here interested in enrolling in our, okay, great. So we can, we can have a conversation afterwards. So I'd like to welcome all of you to, um, we're a 100, well, we were 104-year-old journalism school, but we are also very much at the center of um, innovation and change and rethinking about, and thinking about the future of journalism in, at a time when the industry has been disrupted and where new forms of news gathering, storytelling, and engaging audiences are emerging. This is an exciting time to be in a journalism school because the old is giving way to the new. We still don't know what the shape of the new is going to be, but we at the journalism school are at the center of the conversation about the future of journalism, of journalism in the public interest, of journalism that engages audiences and uses all the technological tools that are available in order to inform the public and to make readers engaged in what is going on around them. We have a world-class faculty that has traditional skills. You will learn from them the fundamentals of reporting and writing. Whatever the changes in journalism, the fundamentals will remain the same. But we, you will also learn from them the way technology is disrupting the way we do news, the way journalism conceives of itself, and the way we are adjusting to the new ways in which especially young people are consuming, distributing, and also on their own producing the news. So welcome everyone. This is a time for you to meet us to ask us questions, to engage with us about your questions about our curriculum and our program. This is also time to walk around the campus. We are in New York City, uh, which is the center of the global media industry. One reason to go to Columbia Journalism School is to be able to enjoy what New York offers. And that's not just Broadway shows. But also, New York is where many of the changes that are, under, that are taking place in journalism are being, uh, are being made, where discussions and, um, discussions and innovations in journalism are taking place. So welcome, and uh, let's, let's resume our first, let's start our first panel, yeah. Do you want me to introduce you? Taryn Almanzar is with our admissions office. If you haven't been in touch with Taryn yet, you should. Taryn can answer all sorts of questions, not only about our programs, but also very important <coughs> questions about financial aid, scholarships, the cost of coming here, etc. So let's start. Yeah. Um. So, as Sheila mentioned, I'm Taryn Almanzar. Welcome on behalf of our office. We're very excited to see you here on this gorgeous Saturday morning. And for those of you who are joining us via live stream and watching us via Facebook Live, welcome as well from wherever you are in the world. If you can let us know where you're at, that'll be great. Um, with that said, I'll just start off by asking, how many of you are from New York City? From other places within the US? International students? Great. And how many of you are interested in our MS program? Masters of Sciences? Masters of Arts? Computer, dual degree with computer science? PhD program? Excellent. Welcome, welcome each and every single one of you. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our faculty panel. Um, who will be discussing classes and um, what the schedule looks like. Also, before I forget, just some housekeeping um, uh, notes, if you will. The uh, restrooms are down the hall. There's food, there's coffee. Please help yourself. Um, and as you're going through this program, just continue to ask yourself, 
what are you hoping to get out of a master's degree? What are your skill sets? What are the things that you need to propel your career to the next level? So that way when you're listening to our faculty panels, our student panel, and career services, you will be able to listen with those thoughts in mind and also to ask those types of questions. Okay, so with that. Hi, I'm Elena Cabral and I am the director of the part-time program. I'm also a graduate of the part-time program and I have a number of roles here at the journalism school. Um, I work in the career services office and in a little while you're going to hear from one of my colleagues in that office all about what we do for students to help them prepare for um, a job, a career path after the 10 months here. And um, I also I'm an advisor to one of many affinity groups here at the Journalism School that do wonderful work in terms of professional development, uh, providing a community for students of different backgrounds. My uh, group is called the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and it's a really active group that is uh, very involved and that actually will be having a meeting with the um, recruiter from the New York Times next week who has a, a special institute for members of the Hispanic Journalists Association and the Black Journalists Association. By the way, you don't have to be black or Hispanic to join these. These are organizations whose purpose is to improve coverage of these communities. And the New York Times has this amazing institute for uh, two weeks after graduation where students um, can work with New York Times reporters and editors uh, to produce a product. It's part of their effort to, to, to take part in the training of these individuals to, in the hope that they may hire them someday. Um, and uh, so uh, the, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, Dean Coronel and I can talk specifically about the MS program. Um, I will just say that uh, the part-time program is somewhat different than the 10-month program, but it is very much the same degree. Um, it's for those, like myself, who uh, really wanted to hold on to that job while they were working and in a way extend their experience here. Instead of 10 months, it's two years. It's basically six semesters, a summer, fall, and spring, and then another summer, fall, and spring, um, in which you take uh, the very same classes. A few of them are, are isolated for part-timers simply because of their schedule. And, um, but uh, throughout, especially the big courses in the spring, the six credit courses, you are mingling with them. And you do also make the same choices as the, as the full-time students. Do I want to be a data concentrator? Do I want to apply for the Stabile program, the documentary program? Um, there's lots of ways. Uh, I think more than ever to do uh, this uh, uh, to do this MS degree, and uh, the part-time program is just one of them. All right, let me tell you about uh, what the core of our. I'll talk about the MS program, and I believe David Haydu is here, um, and he's a professor who teaches in our MA program, and he will talk more about that. So the MS program is intended for beginning journalists who have you know up to three years experience, but it's also a lot of our students also have no journalism experience at all. They've come from other professions. In my class, for example, I've had lawyers, I've had a former policeman, I've had um, army veterans, we've had doctors, oh, yes. um, private investigators, we've had uh, uh, many different types. Um, mm -hmm. I have a flight attendant who actually lives in Georgia and flies to New York every uh, week to attend class. So prior journalism experience is not a requirement for enrollment in our MS degree. We are open to everybody who is, who, any applicant who is curious about the world, wants to make an impact in that world by using the tools of journalism to inform the public and to defend the public interest. The heart of what we teach you in the MS program is reporting. It is getting the facts and getting them right. It is not as easy as you think. And as you will see in this current, uh, what do you call it, post-factual era, where narratives overwhelm fact, where opinion and gossip and rumor overwhelm fact, we need journalists more than ever. We need people who are interested in ferreting out information that can be corroborated and verified and use that information to tell compelling stories that engage audiences. That's the heart of what we do in the MS program. We, 
We teach you how to gather facts and to tell stories using those facts. We tell you the magic of storytelling. I sometimes think of journalism as, as like alchemy. You know, the alchemists of the Middle Ages, they made um, precious metals out of base metals. This is what we do. From the base metals of interviews, images, sound, um, research and gathering of information, data, we put all of these together and create magic. And that magic is reporting and storytelling. So this one year that you will be in the MS program is a sort of teaching you how to create that magic and how to do it in a way that is ethical, that honors the traditions of journalism, which, is, which are fidelity to the truth, fairness, accuracy. We teach you how to do that and also to use the tools that are available to tell stories that are engaging and compelling. So we teach you how to do audio, if that is what you want. We teach photo, we teach video, we teach data and data visualization. So our curriculum runs like this. In August, when you first come here, you will be doing what we used to call a boot camp, but no longer. It's an immersion in digital skills. Everyone, all students in the MS program, will learn how to use their mobile phone, not the way you use it now, but as a reporting tool. That means using it to take pictures, to record sound, to publish instantly using social media platforms where the audiences are. So you don't ex you no longer expect the audience to come to you, but you go to them. So we engage our audiences in these new platforms. You learn how to use these new tools, social media tools, the tools of, of sound and image, um, in order to publish stories. So you will be out in the field almost from day one. You'll be out in the streets in New York, gathering stories, talking to people, observing how people live and work, and listening to people as they tell you what matters the most in their lives. So we teach these tools in the context of reporting and storytelling. The first seven weeks of your fall semester, you will be learning the fundamentals of journalism in what we call our simply our reporting class. This is an intensive class. We will go out to the streets of New York and report on a beat. Some of our beats are geographical, others are topical. The second seven weeks of the fall semester, you will be in a writing class where you will hone your writing, regardless of whatever medium you want to be to work in eventually, writing is an essential skill. The, to, the techniques of finding what is interesting, what is important, they say journalism is making, is all about making uh, the important interesting. Yes. So this is what we do, finding out first what is important and telling, conveying what is important in an interesting way. The second half of your fall semester will be focused on writing. The second half, you will also have the option to take audio, to immerse yourselves more in audio, video, photo, or data. We have specializations in our MS program. These are the data specialization for students interested in practice of journalism that has an emphasis on data. We have an investigative journalism specialization, which is learning, immersing yourselves in investigative techniques to be able to expose wrongdoing in the public interest. And we have a documentary specialization, which is a three semester program, which is designed for those who want to produce long form video documentaries. All if you do not want to specialize in any of these, you will still have a chance to learn investigative techniques. Um, investigative techniques, we have a mandatory seven-week investigative techniques class for all MS students. And there's an investigative component in the MA classes as well. Those of you who want to learn video for news or video for the web, you don't have to enroll in the documentary program because you can create your own track for immersing yourself in video. For those of you who want to do radio, whether in podcast or in more classic public radio format, we have classes for you as well. For those of you who are more interested in narrative long-form writing, we have an array of narrative long-form classes with some of the best practitioners in the field teaching our classes, whether you want to do literary journalism 
or long-form journalism on a particular topic such as education or reporting about ideas, for example, we have classes for you. We have, I dare say, the richest array of journalism classes of any journalism school in this country and the world, taught by some of the most experienced and uh, most innovative professors in their field. The spring semester, if you follow me, talk about the fall semester now, the spring semester gives you, uh, allows you to choose from a variety of classes, whether it's video, we have video storytelling classes, we have long form video, we have video for news for those interested in a career in broadcast. We have several types of data classes. We have international reporting classes. For those of you who are interested in international reporting, we have a conflict reporting class. We have subject specific classes. Our dean teaches a class on reporting on national security. We have classes on reporting on, on education. We have classes on reporting on science and the environment. We have classes on business. We have a class, a very popular class on sports journalism. For those of you interested in um, investigative classes, we have a whole array of investigative offerings as well. You, you can do a class on investigating healthcare or doing interna cross-border international investigations. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have classes that mix data and investigative journalism. We have classes that mix topics with video. So there is a wide array of things to learn. Are, it's often the most difficult for our students is to choose among the many interesting classes that, that we offer. Every MS student is also required to take what we call the, the essentials of journalism. And these are classes in law, uh, media law, which is very important to learn in an age where many people seem to be litigious against the media, uh, where there are also many legal minefields that you can fall into, such as privacy, copyright, etc. So how do you report and write and publish safely and securely? We have classes on media ethics, a class on the history of, the, of journalism, and a class on the business of journalism, because increasingly now you have to learn about how newspaper, how news organizations make money, if only for you to decide which news organization you will be working for and that has a viable revenue model that will allow you to be employed and have health care for a, the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. So I'll take questions later if you have any more questions about our program. Our curriculum is a bit complicated. If you need more information, you should go to come to our website and look under programs and choose which program you're interested in and you'll have much more detailed explanation of our curriculum and all our course offerings are also listed there. David Haydu. Hi. I should say that I was here early. She, he was, I saw him. And, and on time, and was told to come back in 15 minutes. So, I'm sorry. I, uh, Introduce yourself, David. My name is David yeah. Haydu. I'm one of the uh, eight professors who teach in the MA program, the Master of Arts program. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, most journalists pride themselves in being generalists and having the ability to take on any subject and report on it quickly and accurately and learn fast and uh, produce a responsible story uh, quickly, no matter what the subject is. Other, so other journalists decide uh, to specialize, to write in a particular subject area and to do so with expertise and authority in that subject area. There's not only one way to do it. Some people prefer to write with an in-depth knowledge of a spe in a specialized subject area. Now, if, uh, if scarcity is a measure of value, that is an approach that uh, has increasing value in the contemporary journalism world because there are, generally speaking, uh, fewer and fewer uh, people who come to journalism with deep knowledge in the in subject area. So the MA program provides a concentrated focus on four areas of subject. And there are two professors who teach the program in each of the four subject areas. There's uh, politics. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about the professors in the end. Uh, politics, which is taught by uh, Nicholas Lemon and Zan Alexander Stila. 
uh, Business and Finance, which is taught by James B. Stewart. And uh, the next term, we have a, a new professor teaching, or is it this term? This, um, this term, this we have term Eduardo Porter. Eduardo uh, Porter from the New York yeah. Times teaching. That's awesome. Uh, Science, taught by Marguerite Holliday. Holloway, Marguerite, oh my gosh, Holloway. She's in the office next to mine. <laughs> Marguerite Holloway and Jonathan Weiner, and Arts and Science, which is taught by Elisa Solomon and me. Now, all the professors are leading practitioners in their field with body, deep bodies of work, several books, lots of awards, who write prominently for The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, uh, the Nation, the New Republic, Harper's, like that. Uh, the program draws from the expertise of other uh, professors and experts here on campus. And a significant portion of the, of the lectures here, the, the classes here, I should say, because it's a s seminar format, not a lecture format, of the classes are co-taught with uh, with professors who teach in the other schools here at, the, uh, here, here at Columbia. And that's one of the great assets of the program. If in arts and culture, for instance, we're teaching aesthetic theory, which I can do perfectly well, uh, I think I'm better off bringing in um, uh, one of the leading you know, theoreticians of uh, in the world, who you know, who's teaching in the English department or in anthropology, will bring in Paige West, who teaches anthropology or architecture. Uh, will bring in Reinhold Martin. So, uh, I would say roughly one quarter of this of the of the units are co-taught with with experts. The students write a master's thesis that is a rough eight thousand words, although it could be a hybrid thesis and it could be video and it could be audio. That. Uh, meets the standards of publication and the, uh, the best publishers of long-form work in the country. I had a student two years ago whose thesis uh, was nominated for a National Magazine Award. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary. I think most of the, f f most of the faculty uh, would love to win a National <laughs> Magazine Award. Um, and that was, a, that was a student from two years ago. Mm -hmm. Our graduates I could speak for the arts program more than I could speak for the other programs, but our graduates are leading voices in arts journalism at uh, the Huffington Post, uh, Slate, Newsweek, uh, Time, uh, and publications literally around the world. A graduate from the MA program in arts and culture three years ago had the cover story in Newsweek last week on the women of the CIA that I get the MSN news app, that's what I use all day, and it was the second story under top stories in the MSN app, and that was one of our graduates from three years ago. I'm, I'm fiercely proud of it, and all the professors are. We, I think we all feel that the MA program is the program that we wish existed when we were in school. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was nothing like it when we were in school. Mm -hmm. There was nothing like it when I came here about 10 years ago. And there's nothing else like it anywhere else. Uh, it's a hybrid program that is partly academic, but, but mostly journalistic. That challenges students to develop expertise and think in a deep, authoritative way on the subject area. And there's literally no other program like it. And I'll answer questions also in the end. I, th I think, David, you should explain what so sorts of applicants you're looking for. In the, in the uh, MA yes. program, it's different from the MS yeah, program. The applic yeah, we are looking for students uh, who uh, already know how to write and already have some experience in journalism. Now, some of our students have been beat reporters or columnists for alternate weeklies. One, two, uh, two I could think of off the top of my head had books published before they came. Uh, some were quite developed as writers before they came here. They knew how to report, they knew how to do an interview, they knew how to structure a news story, but they just didn't, un when they're writing about the arts in my case, they hit a wall uh, and didn't understand art policy, art law, copyright law, how the art market works. They throw around a word like postmodern because it sounds cool but don't really understand what it means. <laughs> Uh, do a lot of name checking because they could get away with it but can't write in a deep way. 
So uh, we look for students who already have some degree of skills, but we're flexible. If there's something in the application that clearly shows that someone has talent, talent and intelligence, but say hasn't had a great deal of journalism experience, we'll consider that student. Any, and, yeah. okay? okay? All right. I think we should open it up now for yes. questions. Yeah. You're a journalist, so I'm figuring you have mm -hmm. lots of questions. We have a mic um, in the middle over here. If you can um, speak into the mic, that will be great. So the audience that are joining us via live stream and Facebook can hear your questions. That'll be great. Hi, my name is Cleo. I'm interested in the MS program, so I have a question about that. Um, I'm wondering what makes an applicant that has little to no journalism experience stand out, and what helps them continue to stand out as students? Well, what we're looking for in, in an applicant is, you know, is this person really committed to a career in journalism, as opposed to someone who's, you know, figuring out what they want in life? So that, that commitment can be demonstrated in various ways. It can be, say, from the internships um, that person has taken in the past. Has that person worked for a college newspaper or some other publication? Has that person done some, you know, some reporting even for blogs or for... So the, the, I, I think what we're looking for is people who are interested in going out there and talking to people and getting information as opposed to somebody who, say, wants to, uh, you know, be in their pajamas in their bedroom and write about what they feel about what's, you know, their life or what's going on. So it's much more, journalism is much more outward uh, looking. It's less self-referential. So we're looking for that, an interest in the outside world, an interest in the news and what's going on in the outside world. So the ability to write is something which, which will de be demonstrated in your essays, the ability to write coherently, to have structure in your writing, to put words together, to, uh, but also to, to, have, to have substance. So both the style and the substance of the writing is what we're looking at. Grades matter less to us, to tell the truth. They do matter at some point when we, when we look at evaluate everybody, but we're, you know, journalists are, it's very hard to say that there's one type of journalist, mm -hmm. right, or who will be successful in journalism. But I think we want to see people who are intellectually curious, um, interested in the world, passionate about what, what they do, and able to, you know, overcome challenges in life. Thank you. Also, I can add to that and say that in the MA program, we're looking for applicants who can think. And we, we, we look for evidence of a strong capacity for analytical thinking in, uh, in the applications. And there are times when we've had applicants uh, who had very few published clips, but the essays were dazzling, and they really showed a great mind at work. And grades also count, but we, in the MA program, we look sometimes, if someone got Ds in rhetoric, logic, and philosophy, we'll be concerned. Mm. <laughs> yeah. you know. Hi, my name is Camilla. Um, I'm interested in the MS program as well, and I was wondering about the part-time program. Mm -hmm. If you could kind of describe like a, a a semester in the life of that type of student and the balance of working and how many hours they could kind of nest sure. out on both sides? The uh, application cycle for the part-timers is exactly the same for the full-timers. So you apply now, you find out in March, you pay your deposit uh, May 1st, and then unlike the full-timers, you come to class um, at the end of May and um, you're asked to choose between which section of reporting uh, you want to be in. We have various sections because we know that people's schedules can be all over the map. So you can either take the reporting class uh, on a Saturday from 10 to 4, or you can take it on a Tuesday, Thursday evenings, um, 6 to 9 p.m. That class is the only class you take over the summer. Um, it is a class that, as uh, uh, Dean Cornell pointed out, is really focused on news gathering, interviewing, all of those fundamental skills. So there's not a huge amount of you know, uh, writing that goes on, but it's still extremely intensive. When I did this program, I like to describe it as having a, uh, another full-time job. 
because we do expect that part-timers have somewhere in the area of six to eight hours of reporting and writing time. Um, what does that mean? That means that if you work full-time, as I did, you have to find a way to scrape together um, this uh, time to report uh, in the early morning, on your lunch hour, after work, and on weekends. Is it possible? Absolutely. We structure the this whole program in a way that uh, is based on what I refer to as enterprise reporting, meaning we don't tell you what stories to cover, you find them. And so I learned pretty quickly that um, if I'm working from, from 10 to 5, I don't look for stories that, you know, where I have to actually, you know, get out of my office and go down to a public school and do a story about teachers or students. I'm going to choose something that I know I can report. And New York City is such a, a dynamic place. You can get a lot of stories on a Saturday because that's when people are out in the streets and, and, and doing um, uh, and really accessible. Now, are there sources that will only talk to you during business hours? Yes. So that's why I like to say this is not a night school because there has to be some flexibility in your work schedule, not just to catch those sources or you know, uh, when, they, when they'll only talk to you, but also to enjoy and take advantage of the richness of everything that goes on in this building because we have so many speakers who come to us for career services um, talks on, you know, um, uh, meet the media, for example, which brings in uh, recruiters and editors and reporters, alums, um, to, you know, the Pulitzer jurors who meet with our students um, and talk to them. And, and those are the sorts of things that uh, you want to make time for. Uh, throughout the course of the year. So I always tell people, save up those vacation days and personal days and everything you've got because there may also be a course at some point in the six semesters that you really want to take. For example, the book writing class, which I took actually, um, and it was a full day. But that is such an amazingly successful class. It's produced, I don't even know how many published authors that I just had to have a piece of it. So I, I, what I did was I saved up my vacation days, calculating that if I reserve one day a week for 15 weeks, which is the general length of a semester, that's two weeks of vacation and change, done. And those are the types of maybe personal sacrifices that it takes to really make the most of this program. But it absolutely is doable if you have um, some flexibility. I would say that if you're the kind of person who regularly works 12 hours a day, it's not for you. Um, and uh, some students will start the program in the summer and then decide to accelerate where they would finish in three semesters. There is that opportunity. It doesn't happen a lot because I think you should really sort of know what you're doing when you check that box yes. For the rest of the semesters after that summer, um, there are plenty of offerings at night and on a Saturday, for example, the video class that a lot of students gravitate to, there's always a section on a Saturday. Um, and so, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of ways to navigate this without really having to interrupt your working life. But as I said, you have to have some flexibility. My name is Brian. I'm uh, interested in the uh, Stabil Investigative Journalism Program. Uh, you mentioned that you're able to take those investigative journalism program or those classes when you're not in the program. Yeah. Can you talk about the difference between those two paths of actually being in the program versus taking it from without and what the advantages are of doing it within the program? Okay. So um, there is a specialization, we call it, in investigative reporting that we offer. It's, it's part of the regular MS program. The differences are if you're in the specialization, you have investigative reporting classes throughout the year, from day one to the end of the semester. You will be doing in the, in the first semester a 15-week class called Investigative Techniques, which is largely an immersion in investigative reporting techniques so that you will be able to start working on your master's project. So all students are required to do a master's project, but if you're in the investigative program, your master's project has to be an investigative report. That means you must come out with something new and revelatory on a matter of public interest, usually about a wrongdoing that the public has to know. So it's, it's, it should be something that has not been published before. You should come out with original information. 
And so the first semester prepares you for that. In the second semester, you continue with an investigative seminar that talks more about the history of investigative reporting, how it's changing, how technology is changing, the way investigative reports are researched, reported, published. It also looks at the issues such as surveillance, security that um, investigative reporters have to deal with. We look at international investigative journalism as well, and we look at investigative reporting on specific topics such as business or race, etc. But I, also in the spring semester, you will be doing a six credit seminar on investigative reporting in addition, where you actually work in groups on an investigative report. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually be working throughout the year on two major investigations. The difference, if you're not in the investigative reporting program, you, everybody, whether you like it or not, is now required to do a seven week investigative techniques class. So instead of the 15 weeks, you do a seven week introduction to investigative techniques. You are not required to do an investigative master's project, but if you're not in the investigative program, you can take any of the investigative reporting classes in the spring, which are intensive. You'll be working on investigations, but not being in the program also allows you more flexibility. Being in the specialization does not give you much wriggle room in terms of choices of classes. Outside of the specialization, you have the chance to learn investigative techniques while also immersing yourself, say, in video or audio or data or any, or, or long form reporting, which a lot of our students are very interested in. So it really depends on how much flexibility you want. If you're not sure whether investigative reporting is what you want, I urge you to go into the general program, which gives you the chance to do investigative reporting classes as well. Thank you. We'll have chance for one more question. Hi, um, my name is Michelle. I'm interested in the MS program, and my question is specifically for Elena, as a graduate of the MS program yourself, mm -hmm. I was wondering in what ways has the program been a good investment in your journalism career? Oh, wow. You know, that is the million dollar question, you know, <laughs> because I have to say, you know, I think every student who graduates from here feels the way that I do, which is it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Yes, you know, there's, there used to be this debate about whether or not to go to J school and whether it was necessary, and I think that debate is over simply because of the way that our, our industry has changed and how important these skills are, and, and, and not just the skills themselves, but incorporated into a program that really teaches you how to do the highest level of journalism in the very best way. Um, nobody does it better than us, and I, I, I knew that uh, coming in. Uh, to this school and took full advantage of it. And what I discovered was that unlike college, you know, where I'm you know, getting a great education, I was a student here at Columbia College, um, you know, and I made the best friends of my uh, life, right, for uh, the friends that I had for a lifetime. Here, I found that I was making really the, basically the, a family, the, a family of, of people who would be there for me for the rest of my working life. You know, and they remain there. Why? Because we have over, you know, 100 years of, of grads out there, uh, and they come back here to recruit. They are always wanting to give back. And that is the a type of investment that lasts beyond the classroom. It's not just about what you learn here. It's about who's there for you after you graduate. Um, and uh, I, I found that, that uh, you know, I was in the newsroom in the Miami Herald and could call up Sam Friedman, my reporting professor, to ask him for advice about something that I wasn't sure about doing and didn't want to ask my editor about. You know, that safety net was always there for me, um, even after I graduated. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I think, a, an investment that you have to think of as a long-term investment. Um, but, you know, you, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, and so, particularly for part-timers, I really do emphasize uh, that part of it, uh, that, that how, the more that you invest in being part of this community, the, the more it will give back to you when you go into the working world. Thank you. Thank you so much for, to our faculty panel. Um, for those of you that may have questions now or you think of them later, because if you're anything like me after you have walked away, you're going to think of 20 other questions that you should have asked, please feel free to reach out to us um, or to our faculty members. They'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions. So with that, thank you so much. And I would like to welcome now our student panel.
got mine. Yes. I don't know where we want to put us. This is your friend's I'll sit in Elena's seat since I'm the part timer. Right? No, that's all. Okay. <laughs> Someone forgot this. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Should we just introduce ourselves, like, down the road? All right. Hi, I'm Quincy Trujillo. I am a second year part-time student. So I have just started my second year. I submitted my master's project this last summer. And um, I was never, I was I very zero experience in journalism before coming here. Um, I was a high school teacher in Southern California, moved out here just because I wanted a change and um, you know, kind of did whatever while I was here and then became acquainted with some people at the school attended a couple of things that kind of went, oh, hey, journalism actually sounds about right, because I've always been a bit of a storyteller, and ended up applying and decided part-time because I didn't have a full-time job in journalism or anything, but I kind of felt like I wanted to dip my toe in and make sure that this is what I wanted to do, and it's been a tremendously amazing experience. I now am um, a part-time intern with the New York Times Upfront Magazine, which is where Elena used to be as well, and um, it's just, yeah, that's my brief, succinct int introduction. Nice. Um, hi, my name is Igor. I'm, the, um, I'm in the full-time MS program. I, my background, I'm originally from Macedonia, Southern Europe, and I went to college in Southern California, actually. Um, I um, Chapman University in Orange oh, County. Oh, yeah, it's from Orange County. Okay. Um, I, did, I did film in undergrad, and uh, one summer I went back home to Macedonia, and uh, the film industry in Macedonia is pretty much non-existent, so I had nothing to do. And uh, my friend told me they had an open spot at a newspaper for uh, culture reporting. And I said, okay, sure, I'll take it. And uh, quite coincidentally, at the same time, uh, the government of Macedonia imprisoned a investigative journalist from that newspaper where, where I was working. The guy was actually sitting like two tables down. And um, they imprisoned him for something like trivial. I mean, he was uh, investigating um, murder, uh, found inconsistencies in the government account of a murder of another investigative journalist. And um, at that point, I was like, oh, I mean, I, Macedonia fell like 40 places down on the world. Um, Reporter Freedom Index, um, and published by uh, Reporters Without Borders. I went back to Orange County, and I was like, okay, like I don't, I mean, I do want to do film as well, but I, this is what I do want to do. I um, declared it as my second major. I um, started working for the college newspaper. I became an editor the next year. I um, also started working as a foreign correspondent for that newspaper, and um, I pretty much focused on journalism. After that, I worked for uh, the Orange County Register for a little bit for uh, this investigative journalism crew in Macedonia called Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, which uh, Sheila knows a lot about. They're um, an amazing uh, group of people uh, all throughout the Balkans, which in very, um, I would say, uh, severe conditions for journalists do amazing work. They were actually um, um, quoted by the New York Times the other day. And um, yeah, I came here, applied, and uh, it's been a good ride so far. Hi, I'm Rahima. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, and I've been working as a journalist for the past 10 years. I'm a radio journalist, and I, uh, the past four years have been particularly interesting because I've been located in Parliament, in the South African Parliament, and I've been immersed in that world, so it's been a great learning experience. But I've always wanted to come to Colombia. But the issue for me was when, when was the right time? And I think that's probably a question that many of you are asking yourselves if you, ha if you are working journalists and have been in the industry for a long time. How do you find the time to go back to university? So I always knew I wanted to do it, it was just a matter of when. And I thought it's now or never. So if in your gut you're feeling, I have to do this now, do it. And it's been a great experience so far. Um, when people ask me, why did you come to Colombia? Um, what's the reason? So I have a very long answer, but I also have the short Twitter answer. And my short Twitter answer is Spider-Man. So when I told this to one of my classmates recently, and she looked at me, and she said, because you wanted to be in New York? And I said, no. Spider-Man, because with great power comes great responsibility. And the power of the media and the power that individual journalists hold. Um, 
it's it you need to you need to use it responsibly and i was cognizant of that and i and i knew that i wanted to improve on my journalism i wanted to improve as a writer as a political journalist and um and that's why i came to colombia so i'm in the politics concentration which made sense for me and it's been a great ride so far thank you um what can you tell them about yourselves when you were sitting in that chair? What were the things that you were thinking about um, that made you decide, like, okay, this is it? What well, are the questions? Well, f first I want to say, there's, you're getting a lot of information today, and I remember sitting there going, wait, well, okay, what, how does this work, and what's the structure of, of part-time versus full-time, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Trust that those questions will get answered when they need to get answered. Just trust it. It will, everything works out. Don't be overwhelmed by here's what this schedule is or here what that, here's what that schedule is. Just know that, that this, is, this is the only place to study journalism. This is. And I know that's, you know, you're going to be like, okay, okay, stop, okay. But it's, it's, it's absolutely right. I mean, there, you know, I know people at other schools in the city and the opportunities that we have here are unmatched absolutely unmatched. Um, my class last week, um, I, I'm in the, the ethics class, we had Don Lemon come into class, uh, we sat and had a, a round table discussion with George Stephanopoulos last week. Yeah, other schools aren't doing that. They're not. You know, we, we, we have just a tremendous opportunity to do and, and, and meet with the most amazing professionals in this, and it's New York, so our access is, is, is amazing. Um, but, you know, the questions I had were obviously financial related, and it is it's a <laughs> it's a huge commitment and and I'm you know not I want to say non-traditional student, but i'm I'm older. I'm not fresh out of undergrad. I have debt from from other things I was a high school teacher, so I still had debt from from uh, my teaching credential program that I did um, from moving out here. I mean, but the the risk is so worth the reward, and, and I say that now one year into the program, I, I, I don't regret it at all. It's, you know, I, and it, it's actually, it's, it's sage words from Elena, she said, you know, they can't repossess your mind, you know, and I, that's absolutely just true. So that's, that was the big question I had, and no, worth it, worth every penny. Um, I remember uh, I went to the orientation in April, um, and a lot of the students that were there were um, actually international. I don't know how they happen to be, or I mean, even now we have 40% international, right? Is it something like 40 in the MS program? And um, a lot of questions that, that people had, and that I had too, was um, will I have a medium to publish while I'm a student at Columbia? Because um, in my case, I had a few clips from, from the previous places where I've worked, but, but there were students like, um, uh, Chloe, um, Cleo, sorry, um, you mentioned that you, you might be a little worried that you don't necessarily come from an orthodox uh, journalism background. Um, and yes, the answer is yes, you will have a, a, a medium to publish it, um, or, or at least a lot of the classes do. Um, we have um, a website called The Uptowner, check it out if you get a chance, it's basically um, by a beat that we're covering. My reporting section is covering uh, Harlem, East Harlem, uh, Washington Heights and Inwood and whatever story we find there we pitch it to our uh, professors who are the editors of the website and um, they approve it they edit it and uh, yeah I mean so far I have a few clips that are um, New York centered. So one of the questions that I had was is it worth it because I subscribe to the school of thought that everything most of the things you learn about journalism you learn on the job so everyday experience. And so that was the question I was grappling with. But I decided, and it's been, it's been answered since uh, in the past month, that you come here and you unlearn some of the things that you had learned over the years. So some of the habits that you pick up as a journalist. And so one of our classes, it's been a process of unlearning, but it's also been a process of looking at the industry and looking at yourself critically to be able to understand what we as an industry have done wrong and what we are doing right. So you get that opportunity and I don't know um, 
well, for, in my newsroom, and particularly because I've been a correspondent, so sort of isolated from the office, but I did not get the opportunity to engage with my editors or with my colleagues as much and talk about these things. And I'll give one example because it was recently discussed in one of our classes. It's the Rolling Stones story. So something like that. What went wrong? What was the breakdown? So that as an industry, and I mentioned this in the opening, that we can be responsible in our reporting, that we can... Uh, do justice to this profession. So if that's what you're thinking about, then this is the right move. Thank you, thank you so much. I would like to open it now for questions. Um, so please, um, as you have done before, go to the mic so that our um, viewers can, can hear you and see you. Always the first to jump for questions somehow, but uh, I have a question for Quincy and Igor. I guess I'm splitting it both ways. So I, get such extreme anxiety when it comes to exams. So in regards to the written exam, I was wondering how did you guys prepare for it? What do you wish you had known prior to it to have better prepared for it? And um, an off, uh, a side question, do you guys get any sleep? Because I know that it's really intense and I just wanna know, can you guys get at least a full night's rest <laughs> despite everything? Um, as far as the written exam is concerned, it's like ancient history now because it was quite a while ago <laughs> since I, I'm a part-timer. But, um, you know, the, the advice that, that was given to me from people who had attended this program before was just really be up on current events. Um, you know, think about things that have, you know, major news stories and even just like the past 10 years. Um, anything that's, you know, that get, start getting your journalistic, you know, to, to go on the, the Spider-Man, you know, your sense is tingling. And, and just, you know, get, if you aren't already consuming news, start consuming news, like as much as you possibly can. And just think about it, kind of step outside and think about how these stories are reported, um, you know, what's, what's worthy and what's not. That, that's my advice for the written part. Um, as far as sleep, yeah, I mean, the part-time program is, is slower paced. Um, uh, I know people, I mean, people in, in my little kind of cohort that started at the same time as me, some of them work, you know, one girl was at NBC News while she was with us and now she's with Vice and works like full, full time, like producer, like she's amazing. And, uh, you know, we've got most of the people in the part-time program have full time, full commitment jobs and are doing this on the side. but make it work. It's totally manageable. Um, I'm fortunate that I have, I mean, not that fortunate because it's part-time, but I have a part-time internship, so I have f flexibility. I have plenty of time. Um, and, you know, what you'll hear is people get very consumed and very stressed out, especially in the full-time, but yeah, I hear it every, every year, these two years. Um, it, it's time management, you know. Um, approach this program like a job. It's not just, it's not just a school. It is Treat your instructors and your professors like editors. Um, come with professionalism. Manage your time like a professional, and you will be fine. If you treat this like undergrad, you're going to stress out, and you're going to freak out, and you're going to wonder, and oh, why, you know. But treat this as a professional experience, and you will not be overwhelmed. That's what I think. Cool. Yeah, I would, I mean, uh, everything she said there's no really a, I don't think there's a way to study for it or you, if you want to apply here I'm sure you're media or savvy or interested in um, current events um, do know what Aleppo is <laughs> they, <laughs> they might I mean yeah like it was a very fun test I actually enjoy I mean I have anxiety from tests as well but this one was so like broad and 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 it wasn't like exact answer there, there's no right and wrong it's what you think um, so I, uh, it was, and everyone that I talk to now, actually, like, people enjoyed taking that test, um, for real. As far as sleeping goes, um, I don't sleep, but I, that's because I choose not to, <laughs> because, uh, it's really hard to point that out, and even to other students, when I came to the orientation, when were telling me about the camaraderie among the, the, the journalism students, and I'm not, I'm not sure if, if that can be, uh, delivered in, in only, um, one speech, you know, or one session, but that exists and it's real and it's awesome. Um, I mean, last night, for example, two of our uh, journalists, and we've only been here in this program for uh, like two and a half months now, um, or less than two and a half. So um, two of our friends had a birthday, 80 of us showed up at the bar, went back home late, had to wake up early, didn't sleep, no regrets. Um, the thing also, like, for example, we have a, a, 
Central Park picnic this Sunday. If you guys, any of you want to come, uh, please, by all means, it's sh in uh, Sheep's Meadow. That's right, uh, 12 to 5. Uh, you'll meet, we have, at least on the Facebook page, which is not a very accurate source, but uh, <laughs> we have uh, like 100 people attending. Um, by all means, come, enjoy. It's going to be a nice weather. Um, ask all the questions that you want to ask. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Olivia. I'm interested in the MS program, I think, but um, my interests are sort of, they seem to fall between the MA and the MS program in that I've been working in book publishing for the last six years and I'm interested in this as a career change, but I'm also interested in covering my own industry. So in some ways, I, I already sort of know what I want to, what I'm interested in writing about, but I don't have the experience and I'm too close to my own industry to, to be able to start, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm wondering if it's common for people to come in in the MS program with a specific idea of what they want to cover or if that's kind of not the right frame of mind. I, I think there's definitely a mix. I know, um, you know, in the part-time program we do have people who are, have been working in journalism for, for a while and or have kind of a focus already um, and whether they want to just enhance their skills and improve their skills or if they are wanting to maybe transition to another area. Um, I think there's all types of, of people. I mean, I kind of came into this program uh, fairly sports-minded, and that's kind of where I've stayed, whether that's gonna be how I, where I go with, with a career track. I'm not so sure yet, but um, it's definitely one of my main areas of interest, and it's kind of like, okay, well, I can do that, but it's also good to kind of keep the general um, Educate, you know, the, the that part, like the kind, kind of keeping your your options open and being open to learning about other aspects of journalism or other uh, topics in journalism as well. So I don't know if that quite answered your question, but I think you know, um, it, I, it would be interesting to hear how the MA side is is sees that as well. Yeah. So. In my class, not everyone has journalism experience. People, um, there's uh, one of my classmates was working for Morgan Stanley, um, and another classmate was working for an NGO. So you don't necessarily need journalism experience, but you've been working in book publishing, so you have that perspective. And if you're interested in a particular subject, whether it be politics, whether it be sports, then just go for it. And 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 and. Journalism is about it's about telling stories, you know. And if you think that you have that innate ability to do that, to tell a story, to speak to people, um, then then go for it. Uh, one of the one of the great things about the MA course is that it allows you a great networking opportunity. So even if you don't have any contacts in the journalism world, you'll be making it whether it's your whether it's your classmates or it's your professors or the people that you will meet um, um, who are in the industry and who are established in the industry. So you'll get that um, from the MA course. And the international students, you're making contacts all over the world, they're going to remain remain long time friends if you don't mess it up. Um, and and these are you know these these are people that you'll take with you for the rest of your life and who can help you um, if you have questions. So I don't think you should stress too much about that. Okay. Thank you. Hi, my name is Martha, and I've I've started in journalism. It's been ten years since I've been practicing. So I I'm coming back in. And I'm wondering, are you having a fairly robust conversation about analytics, you know, bots, data, how content is being curated on top of or in addition to, you know, the craft of storytelling and attribution and all of that, which is really important. But because we're seeing such a, a change, a sea change right now with the way that information is being distributed nationally and internationally, I just wondered if any of you could sort of touch on some of the skills you're jumping into now on that. Can I start? Of course. <laughs> so, so if you have to look at my calendar, you will see that it's jam-packed. Reason being is because every day there's something happening at the school. So not necessarily your class, but it's lectures that are happening. And we're what you're talking about will be touched on. For example, on Tuesday, they were talking about uh, there was a lecture by Jamil Jaffer on how um, uh, about First Amendment and some of the um, what's happening currently and 
how it's uh, the, the challenges that that um, poses to the First Amendment. So various issues are discussed throughout the year. So it depends on um, which lecture you want to go to, and you know you can sit in on as many lectures as you want in a in a in a given week. So those sorts of things are discussed, not maybe necessarily in my class, in my politics class, but it does happen within um, the Columbia institution. Um, I was going to say, it sounds like you're interested in data, right? Uh, I think so. I'm just learning more about the data concentration. Sure. And I think just because I have personal experience in such a traditional, you know, I worked for a news a community newspaper, right? And it was print. And it was pre-Facebook. Uh -huh. So it's a totally different, content is moving in a totally different way. So I just want, wondered if, and their measurements and mathematical equations. So I was just wondering if anyone had any experience Absolutely. Really um, looking at how that's driving our knowledge. Right. Um, I will put you, uh, I'm in the general program. I will put you in, in touch with people who are in the data specialization Perfect. and that, that will have way more than myself to tell you about it. Uh, what I have experienced personally is we have breakfast on seven, at 7 a.m. on Thursday morning where we actually, um, Mark Hansen, who's the director of the Brown Center for Media Innovation and amazing uh, at, at what he's doing, which is data, um, we're, we're learning Python and R and all of that just for free every Thursday before class. Okay. And I, I've shown up at those. I have no clue whatsoever, or I had no, I hope now I do a little bit. But um, before it started, I just wanted to learn. Um, so you will have many, many... Uh, Things like that, yeah. And it just really, really briefly, constant conversation about how much journalism is changing. Constant. It's every class in every, in some way, of how it's changing and how we can adapt in okay. a general sense. Thank you. And really quickly, um, since it's, it's an international combination of the three of you up here, um, so I lived abroad for two and a half years, and it was really interesting to start to see how dramatically different the freedom of speech functions in terms of media exchanges from one country to another. And I wonder just, f for those of you who are straddling, right, the, the, the U.S. communication versus um, South Africa and Macedonia. Macedonia, right, very different. Um, so much is happening with the Asia sector now. So is there a really robust conversation happening about just the ethics of, of crossing borders, right, with media and with, with respect to each sort of national um, approach to media as opposed to the international media? Mm -hmm. See, does that make sense? I guess it's a question of, of how, does information, uh, how does information move across borders and how are we dealing with it and is that conversation happening because it's moving so fast but there are firewalls in places, and there mm -hmm. are limitations in places, and okay. people are sometimes hurt for sharing information. So is that on the table? Sure. Um, I would say, uh, I would go the other way around uh, for, to answering this question. Um, we have a bigger problem, except the large um, international community that is in the MS program has more of an issue with understanding how American politics works rather than, than the ones from our uh, respective countries. Because um, we don't, I mean, in, here at Columbia, we haven't really done uh, that much international reporting f for now, unless you're in the international reporting class or something like that. So we actually had a, se uh, or we'll have a session on um, American uh, politics 101, in a sense of like bringing it closer to someone who has never lived in the US, how Senate, Congress, and all, all of those um, places work. The thing that's interesting is that you have a lot of eclectic backgrounds I among, among the students. So we had a, my good friend is from Venezuela. So she explained like everything to us about the huge protests that were going on um, the other week there or um, what the Colombian referendum meant. Or, so, so things like that you will get to experience, I would say more through your international friends that will be plenty um, than necessarily through your, through your reporting class, I think. I just want to add on to what Igor said, that these discussions will happen within um, Colombia, but it will also happen in the bars outside Colombia with the international off the record, students. Off the record, always off the record. <laughs> with the international students, and that's what I was talking about, the networking experience, um, that you get to learn about the other countries through the people that you meet. Okay. Thank you. Of course. My name is Raven. Um, I've already sent my application for the MA program for Arts and Culture, 
And I wanted to ask specifically, see, I'm trying, my goal is to be a social media editor for a global fashion or lifestyle magazine. And I wanted to know if there were specific classes that you think would be great for me to take to kind of stay in that focus. And also if the journalism program is just a good a fit as you know the communications practice program here. Well, I mean, I can't really speak to the MA program, um, but I think that as far as the MS program is concerned, there there are a lot of social media is is talked about in just about every class. There is usually at least one class meeting where we talk about it. Uh, in the sports journalism class I took, we focused on it quite a bit just because a lot of sports writers use Twitter frequently and sometimes put their foots in their mouths. Mm -hmm. And um, and talking about you know putting yourself out as a brand and then representing a brand and things along those lines. So. Um, I don't know if that quite gets to your question. And kind of writing and pulling news and research and so forth. Right, right. And and but as far as the MA is concerned, I'm not I'm not sure how that um, works together. Okay. So I'm generally active on Twitter. I have been uh, and need to be for my job. Uh, and I thought that I I knew social media. I mean, I know how to use Twitter. I know how it works. But in one of my classes, in our politics class, um, we had someone come over who is working for Google. And he showed us a bunch of things that I had no idea about. I mean, I was taking notes and I was actually like, I mean, my mind was blown. I had no idea and I realized just how many things are out there and how many resources that journalists have available to them that we're not tapping into. Um, and so, the, yeah, to answer your question, those things are happening and you will learn things that you didn't know because if you think you know everything about uh, what's happening, uh, the current trends, what's new um, on social media, all of those things, there's a lot, there's a lot that you might not know. Um, we've also used, uh, we've learned how to use data miner, which in South Africa actually I've, I've never used. So that's been, that's been good for me as well. Sure. Um, I uh, <laughs> they'll make you use social media whether you want it or not. Uh, they um, basically um, all of, you have to be proficient in all of the obviously the top uh, three or let's say four with Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and um, Snapchat, which I didn't have before I came I came to school <laughs> because I was trying to be a nonconformist. But um, they, they will they will make you use them and um, and it's useful I mean for example we're covering me and uh, one of my uh, friends from my reporting section we are gonna be the editors for uh, Storyfy. I don't know if you've ever okay you, you've had the experience yeah for covering the the second presidential debate so it's all over in every class there's no exceptions great thank you hi my question's just for Rahima huh? um, you said that you had been a, you are a radio journalist yes. and as David was describing the MA program, it seems that it's really geared towards long form writing. Yes. And so I wonder, did you choose it because you wanted to transition away from radio? Or you know, how are you finding that compatible with radio, which is a very different kind of writing, even for a long piece? Mm -hmm. And are you planning, for example, to do your final piece, um, your master's project, something that allows you to do that in audio form? So you are allowed to do it in multimedia, so audio or um, visual. And initially I thought that I would do a dual thesis where I would do my long form writing and then try and do um, a piece, an audio piece. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. It might be too ambitious, but I have been enjoying the process of writing. Um, in, in the writing that I have done so far for some of my classes. It allows me to exercise a part of my brain that I didn't have to for the past 10 years. So it's a challenge and that's the you know, reason you want to come back to university is because you want to challenge yourself, you want to learn a new skill. Um, I was nervous about the 10,000 word master's thesis, which is supposed to be a long form engaging piece of writing that is well researched and that c can be publishable. Um, but it's a challenge that I'm looking forward to. And you know what, if you, 
if you, whether you're in radio or you're in television or you're a print journalist, at the end of the day, the word is journalist. So you have to be multi-skilled, especially in this changing world. So for you, sorry, just to follow hmm. up. So for the people who are in your program, yeah. who are, you said that there are a few of them who do not have a really heavy journalism background already. Mm -hmm. So if they wanted to come out of that and do audio work, do you feel like in the MA program they're getting enough audio experience to be yes. able to go up for those jobs? Yes. So there okay. is an optional um, skills course um, and it teaches you either photography or audio. Um, and many of them have chosen to do the optional skills course. Now, you don't need it, but if you want to, and if you have the, um, the time on your schedule, then it's something that you can do. Like I mentioned, aside from the classes and the courses that you do have, there's so much happening on campus that you can learn new skills, whether it be in the journalism school or whether it be um, in, in, uh, in other parts of the campus. So yes, there is audio. Um, there's another classmate who has television experience. She's a television journalist in Nigeria, and she is nervous about the long form writing, and she was very open about it. But it, again, it's a, it's a challenge that she is ready to face. Good morning. Uh, I was just curious about opportunities for cross-departmental collaboration, if anyone has used that. Um, <clears throat> I know the data department and the, the investigative one are, are, are collaborating on a huge project. Um, I'm trying to think if I have worked with, uh, I mean, from friends, yes, we've gone and we sh we've shot video and like stories, but that's just through our personal kind of like interactions. Um, within, the, I would say the most collaboration you'll do, or at least in my experience, is with your reporting section. Um, as I mentioned, the presidential debate, like we're going to have seven reporters from different places in, in Uptown that are going to be uh, reporting on the, on the debate. So we have someone in, uh, in Wood Bar, someone in the Washington Heights Democratic Center, and, 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 and things like that. So collaboration will be um, on the table 100%. The first one we covered was uh, I was one of the reporters that was in the Apollo Theater. So you have the, that teamwork that you're getting. As for uh, cross departments, I do know of the data and investigative doing a big project now, and I imagine there will be even more of that um, once the further in the, down the program we go. Did, did you mean on campus in general, yes. or did you mean within the journalism school? Oh, within the journalism school. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, okay. sorry, go on. The politics class is involved in a project called election land. So on election day we'll be, and we'll be learning more about this next week, we'll be basically collecting data using social media, um, looking at certain hashtags and looking out for areas there where there may be problems and that's an interesting um, exercise that that will basically uh, you know, it, it's, it's the way the industry is moving, using social media to gather information and write stories. So that's an interesting, I can't tell you too much about it. Uh, firstly, because I'm, I am yet to go for our first meeting. And secondly, because I don't know if I'm allowed to talk too much about it. I will say that um, it's something to kind of repeat what Elena said, you get out of the school what you put into it. Um, there are so many opportunities to have your hand in so many different aspects of journalism in this school. Um, it's just a matter of what you allow yourself to have time for. As a part-time student being here stretched over two years, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, I can't always attend every single thing I want to do, but it's there. It's there if I wanted to grab it. It's there if I wanted to take you know, a video class, a, you know, of, you know, any, anything, um, you know, I've taken data, I've taken photography, I've taken audio, I've taken writing classes, I've sat in on seminars that talk about, I mean, it's, it's, you will have such a robust experience if you kind of seek those opportunities out and they're there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, we would like to thank our student panel. Thank you for thank coming you over here and taking time. And then right now, I would like to welcome Gina Boulogne. I was going to say, I'll be around for questions, too, after if anyone wants to.
Good morning. Let me just get uh, set up here. I have a PowerPoint, a few slides to show you. Uh, <coughs> One second, it'll all come alive in one second. Okay. So I'm Gina Bubion, Director of the Career Development Office. Can you hear me well in the back? And hello to the Facebook crowd and the YouTube crowd as well. Okay, I, I'm part of a small but tenacious team on the, in the Career Development Office here at Columbia. We are all former reporters, editors, and producers who, if you choose to come to Columbia, we will guide you in your, in your search to la land in the, job, in the journalism job market. We do one-on-one -on -one advising. We bring in speakers all year long from media companies. We uh, carry out workshops for you to learn some job skills and we put on the, the Career Expo which is the largest journalism job fair in the country which you probably have heard about. You can see the video on the website and uh, in, the, in, the, in April when the last expo took place more than 150 media companies came to recruit and interview our students for jobs and internships and other opportunities. So first the reality check. There's no guarantee of a job after graduation in this program or any program. Uh, we don't know what the journalism job market is going to look like in May 2017 or May 2018. It's a very capricious field. It is very dynamic. Um, we, do, we don't know which companies will bite the dust. We don't know which companies will rise from the ashes and reinvent themselves successfully. We don't know what kinds of nonprofit um, niche publications will launch and, and take off. Um, but we do know it's a really exciting time to be a journalist and, and uh, regardless of the flux going on in the journalism industry and in the general economy, our students do really well in the job market, not just right after graduation but in, in the years, years to come. So I'm going to share with you some statistics uh, that shows you some, some employment statistics on the class of 2016 that just graduated to give you a, a snapshot of, of you know, the, the, the power of, of the education that you get here, but also a, a picture of, of what's going on in the, in, in the industry. So as of graduation day, uh, uh, with 100% of the class reporting, 71.5% of the class had plans lined up for it right after graduation. And this, this is a broad category that includes jobs, internships, freelance careers, a few people wanted to launch a, a new me media startup, several people want to go back to school for another degree program. There's a whole, whole range of, 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 of types of jobs um, and positions that fall under that, this category. And the international students did a little bit better uh, than the U.S. and green, green card holders in this last year that, that, uh, that just graduated. Uh, in 2015, they did a little worse, and in 2014, they did better, so it really fluctuates. Uh, year, year to year. It's important to keep in mind that the figures that I'm showing you today are gathered from a narrow window around graduation. It's around a two or three week period um, a after graduation. And I'm telling you this because, for instance, the law school takes its measure at, at the 11, mark, 11 month mark after graduation. The business school takes its measure three months after graduation. And you should know this because as you consider other journalism schools, you ought to interrogate their employment data. You want to you fi find out and you know, ask when they took their measure, how many people are included in, in that database, and, and, um, and what percentage of, um, or, or how, how they collected the, the data. Okay, this chart shows you a distribution of jobs or, and positions across different media platforms. And what you're seeing is a constant, I hope you can see that from the very back of the room. What you're seeing is a concentration of positions in, the three, in three big media platforms, the digital only publications, the broadcast, and the newspaper platforms plus their online websites. So what, what this breaks down as is a th one third of the jobs um, 
and in, uh, positions were in digital only companies. And that is the red line at the top and it has been increasing over the years which makes perfect sense to, to all of us who've been wa watching the journalism industry. The next two lines, the purple line and the dark blue line are broadcast in newspaper and they get another sort of 25% each of, of positions. And then the, the bottom two, the green line and the light blue line, that's magazines and news wires, which is the news wires I'm talking about AP, Bloomberg, Reuters. So that, uh, that's kind of how, how things break down. The journal, th th this slide shows the self-reported dis job descriptions that students uh, tell us that they were hired to do upon their first, their first job after, after graduation. And interestingly, regardless of the medium, the vast majority of students will find it, will get a job doing reporting and writing, 56% uh, of the class. And 29% told us that they were primarily hired to shoot and edit and produce video. That number has increased from the year before. Um, so the video jobs, it's interesting to note, these are not just at the networks, but these are at, at the video departments in major news organizations like, like, like the LA, New York Times and, and the Wall Street Journal, and also at the all digital publications like Vice. So uh, there was a question about cross-fertilization amongst departments. The industry has completely melded and, and the, the lines have blurred, so there's a lot of, a lot of overlap, so you will get all, all the skills that you need here. So I want to also comment on that 2% number for on-air reporting. And the reason why is because we, we have plenty of grads in the world who are doing on-air reporting. You know, this is Joe Smith at the scene of the flood, that kind of reporting. So who here is interested in on-air reporting? Well, there, there may be some people in the, in our, on, um, on, on the air audience as well. The reason why it's only 2% is because, again, this is as of graduation. And, and the culture, the, the, the job sort of culture in that field is, is full-time jobs. And so our students who get those jobs have to basically wait until graduation to put together their reel and send it out and go on interviews and land those jobs. So it's a, it's a number that grows over time, but as of graduation, it's small. Um, so after graduation, we heard about students who got on-air reporting jobs in smaller markets like Binghamton, Binghamton New York, Wichita, Kansas, uh, the Telemundo Spanish language station in Boston, and um, there was one other city. Um, uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. The year before, we had students go to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to Charleston, North Carolina. So another reason why it's a small number is this is New York. Students fall in love with the place. They never want to leave. And it's hard to sometimes uh, go to a smaller market to get an on-air reporting job. So that, that is also definitely, definitely at play. So of that 71% that I commented on in the very beginning of this presentation, that uh, nearly everybody goes into journalism. Obviously, it's a journalism school. There's a small percentage, eight or nine percent, who don't go into journalism. They go on to another academic program. They decide to become uh, coders. You know, they, a few of the, the dual degree students uh, in the computer science program got, went to Apple and, and Google, and that's what they wanted to do. So what this chart shows you, you, I don't expect you to read the fine print, but you do see the big, large, green slice. And that is because I want you to see what the big takeaway is, that most, the, the dominance of internships amongst our graduates upon graduation. So this has been the case for years, where internships are the most likely outcome after grad school. It was the case when I was in J, J school many, many moons ago, and it has been the case every year that I've been at the J school, t 10 years. Um, we love internships, and I'm talking about paid internships. We love internships because, um, the internship is usually your best shot to jump to a big publication, a big news organization upon graduation. For the graduate student, the internship is a job tryout, most likely. Uh, employers look at you differently when you're a grad student because they know that you're available after the summer. They know that the undergrads have to go back to school. So you're eyed differently and you're more experienced. And, and, um, and so if there is going to be budget to keep somebody past an internship, that's, that's going to be 
It's oftentimes one of our, one of our students. So even when an internship doesn't lead to a full-time job at that place, one job always leads to another, and a really good intern is never unemployed for long. Uh, to be honest, also, some companies will not hire their interns, but you're vastly better off for having done that internship. Some companies never hire their interns, and they are the places that you would expect, like the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Associated Press. But there are plenty, a much longer list of companies that do hire our students after the end of their internships, the Miami Herald, um, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, it's, there, there, are, there are, are many. Okay, in your packet, you have a list of the 111 companies who hired somebody from the class of 2016 into a job or, job or internship. What I wanted to show you here is the concentration of talent amongst, um, in the biggest companies in the, in the, in the country of our students. So our, the, the quality of the education and the quality of the students here are such that NBC and the Wall Street Journal both hired four people each upon, you know, around graduation. And they, and they hire students into internships, into one-year fellowships, and into jobs. Again, uh, this is as of graduation. After graduation, we hear about stuff all summer long. As an example, two people got hired into fellowships at Al Jazeera. Somebody got a full-time job at the Daily Mail. Another couple people, two people got internships at the Wa Washingtonian Magazine. Um, several students sold, oh, one student got a, a full-time videographer job at uh, Vanity Fair, full-time but freelance basis, she, and she was very happy about that. We hear from students all summer long who have managed to sell their master's projects and theses and place them in major newspapers like, the Wash like um, Rolling Stone, and, which was rare, but it was, it was pretty great when it happened, and, and the New York Times, so, and so on. The summer's very active time for, for the, the continuing um, job search. Okay, let me just talk about pay, because we all know that you are not going into this for the money, right? You're going, it to, going into journalism for the joy of it, right? Okay. Um, internships, the pay range, this is, you know, we, this is a, a funny slide because only a third of the students told us what, you know, we asked, you know, what are you getting paid and only a third divulged the information. So it's not complete. However, this is pretty consistent with what we've seen in, in previous years. Seven fifty an hour for the low, which is, which is low, I will I totally, you know, give you that, up to $1,000 a week with the typical pay for an internship falling in the five to $700 a week range. That's for internships. We don't talk about unpaid internships. We'll never promote an unpaid internship to our students. And every year, maybe two or three people take them of their own volition, usually, um, and they usually have other offers that pay, but they've chosen the unpaid. So when I talk about internships, I'm talking about paid internships. Full-time jobs, the range is 35 to 50,000 uh, with benefits, which is an improvement. I mean, we've seen, you know, when I first started 10 years ago, the benefits were few and far between, and now it's sort of more, much more routine, a part of a, of a package. And the, the, these, the range was very great. I mean, somebody, there was one student who uh, made substantially more than that, and a few who made a substantially more than, than that 50,000 uh, K number, and it's, it's because they had a lot of experience or because they were going into more techie kinds of jobs because they wanted to, you, you know, they just decided they didn't want to do journalism. Um, we have had students get jobs that are, are that well um, paid that are in journalism, with, with, but students with a lot of experience. Okay, I want to show you now, this is really fun to do, and I encourage you to do this. You can go on the, journal, the Columbia Journalism School LinkedIn page, and you can sort and look for alums in your home country, alums at every publication that you're interested in, and I did this, and it, so it's not a complete list, but what it shows you is is how um, concentrated the talent is at the biggest, biggest news organizations in, in the world. And um, when I did my count, I only paid attention to people in full-time jobs who graduated from the MS, MA, or Knight Badgett program. I ignored the bloggers, I ignored the freelancers, and I ignored students who went to other degree programs at Columbia, non-grant, non-degree programs at Columbia, like the publishing course and the communications course that somebody mentioned a bit, a bit ago. So these are just the full-timers. And I'll just take it right from the top only. BuzzFeed, for instance. Our students have dream jobs at BuzzFeed. Uh, some, of the, some of these dream jobs include deputy foreign editor in London, business editor, the worldwide LGBT reporter, the human rights reporter in Africa, the immigration reporter, the criminal justice reporter, the America's editor, the France editor, uh, and the, the tech reporter. And it's a longer list, and you can check it out as well. 
So I encourage you to do that because it's a lot of fun to see where people, people end up. No matter where news breaks, Columbia alums are there. The Panama Papers published in the spring. The two main reporting partners were the Miami Herald and Fusion. And the lead editor and reporters at Fusion were all graduates of this school, actually not that, old, not that um, long ago. And the lead reporter at the Miami Herald, Nick Nehemus, was a graduate of this school. So Nick graduated in 2014, and he took an internship at the Miami Herald first, first stop after J School. He did a great job. He was a nice guy. Everybody wanted him to stay around, so they hired him. And last I checked, he was on, on hurricane duty down in Miami th this weekend. So he's still there loving Miami. Uh, going back to one of the biggest stories of, of last year, last November, the terrorist attacks in France. Our students, our, our graduates were all over that story, reporting for many outlets in the English language. There were five, five grads that I could count at BuzzFeed, um, two at Politico, Brussels, somebody from Vice, from the BBC, from the New York Times, from Reuters, from the New Yorker, all over that story. I counted at least 14 alums during the, that week of coverage, and, and there were uh, probably others in other um, media outlets that I, that I wasn't aware of or different languages. So that brings me to my last uh, few slides, because I thought it would be interesting for you to see the career trajectories of people before and after Columbia. So just taking that one event, the, terror the terrorist attack in France, there were three students, and I did not cherry pick, I literally like picked them at, for, you know, the, the, at random, and um, I'll just let me tell you what they did. So Cecile, class of 2010, she was an intern at Le Monde before Columbia, came to Columbia, got an internship at Slate France immediately after Columbia, and now she's the editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed France. Anoop was a uh, Nepal uh, citizen, citizen of Nepal. He was an intern from, at Forbes before Columbia. He came to Columbia. He was, studied uh, digital media, and then he went to the Atlantic to help them launch a website. Then he went to the Washington Post, and they sponsored him for a visa, and now he's the deputy foreign editor at, at BuzzFeed. And Louise um, de Wast, who was a video reporter at Le Point in France, she came to Colombia, then she got the multimedia internship at the AP um, Paris Bureau, and now she's at ABC News. Somebody mentioned career changers, which we have a lot. The career changers, changers um, spice, really spice things up around here, and they, and they add a lot to the program. Um, and this is just two people at random that I, that I thought, thought of. Uh, so uh, Vicky was, um, her first love was journalism, and uh, she was a high, she got diverted to, to education. She was really interested in education. So she was a teacher for a long time. I mean like, like 10 or 15 years, she was a high school teacher. And uh, she wanted to get back into journalism, her first love. So she took a research job, she was a part-time student, took a research job at PBS NewsHour on the weekends, which the part-time students have time, have time to do. Um, and, that, and now she's the education editor at PBS NewsHour. So in a way, her trajectory makes perfect sense for her. You know, her, there, was, there was her interest in education all along. It was like the through line. Um, so Roxanne was another example, just a recent grad, who went, she had a marketing job after graduation, um, college graduation, and she wanted to get into journalism, so she came here, and her first job was a, as an intern and then an editorial assistant at Mimi, which is a women's magazine digital publication at Time Inc., and now she's the beauty editor. That's just two people. Uh, and, then, and then we have a big group of students who come straight from undergrad, who don't have professional full-time newsroom experience, but they've maybe had, you know, de they've definitely had college newspaper experience and sometimes, you know, summer internship experience. So here's three recent grads. There was Ellen, who was editor-in-chief of the Johns Hopkins newspaper. She came to Columbia, then she went to the Guardian U.S. as an intern, and now she's back in Canada, her home country, at the Globe and Mail. There's Josiah, who was sports editor and metro editor at the Penn State Daily. He came to Columbia, wanted to get away from sports, and sort of relaunch as a, as a um, criminal justice and um, race and poverty reporter. He then got hired at the Marshall Project uh, for a, a fellowship over the summer, and now he is a, a, an, NY, an NBC News associate, which is a very prestigious, very competitive one-year program at NBC. Then there was Laura, who was a section editor, opinion section editor, at the blue, black and red and white, or black and white, I don't recall, but it's, it's, the, it's the campus newspaper of the University of Georgia. And she uh, came to Columbia, and then she got an internship back in her, in her hometown 
a college town paper, the Atlanta Journal and Constitution, and now she's in her second internship at the Texas Observer, which is, you know, for those of you who are into politics and long form writing, it's one of the most prestigious, you know, long form um, digital pu publications in, in the country. So that's basically what I wanted to sh share with you today. I wish you well in your search, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at Columbia. I think I have time to take some questions. Don't be shy. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, data specialization, and I saw on your slide that 6% uh, of students go into sort of the data and computational jobs. Uh, I'm just curious what you're sort of seeing in the, in the field in that sense, and if that 6% is representative of, you know, just that being kind of a small slice of students that are studying that uh, at the school or kind of what you're seeing there. So, so the students in that group include the students in the dual degree computer science program, but also the students in the data specialization, which had a bunch of students this last year. It was a, like a, a rather large class. And um, so these are, those are just the students who said that that was their main, main duty. Um, your question is, what, like, what are they doing or how yeah. easy it is? I mean, all, all editors and reporters say that they want that. I mean, you know, being able to do data visualizations and, and compute data and interrogate data and come up and find stories within, within the data. It's a huge demand. Um, but, you know, even then, we have heard from students who've done it that that editors still hope that you know how to write and report a story, so it's on top of everything else that you're also doing, you know, doing data. Is that, did that answer, or? Yeah, yeah, I think so, thanks. Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Hillary. Uh, my background's mainly in NGO work overseas, and I'm kind of curious, I'm interested in, in pursuing journalism, but I'm also interested in communications for, for nonprofits, and, and it's been interesting to see just how many uh, of the heads of communications departments at major NGOs went to the school. So I'm wondering if you have any data or statistics on, on how people kind of cross that cross-pollination between communications and journalism. And we, we have not, in our office, spent a lot of time uh, sort of infiltrating, you know, communications companies. And that's because it doesn't seem all that it's not in particularly high demand amongst our students. Our students want to be reporters most of all, and that's what they do. We do hear of students who make the leap to communications at some point in the future, and, um, and that's your, your prerogative. I, I feel like, like the J school degree is, is like the gold-plated degree that employers like to see. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, real, it's considered really good training uh, to, to do communications jobs. Every year we have some international students who want to work at the UN. Um, those are really hard jobs to get, but we do have students at the UN. I would say, though, what we tell that student is, are you sure? Why don't you, you know, see if, if you can try to get a job as a reporter first? Because oftentimes, oftentimes students say they want to go into communications and they're just kind of covering their bases, but they really do want to be a reporter. So, um, you know, if that's what you want to do, you can definitely get those kinds of jobs. We just um, don't spend a lot of time think, thinking about them here at the J School. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Gina. Um, so with that, we'll now talk a little bit about admissions, the financial aid process, the timeline. Um, so hopefully at this point you have received a very good idea about our programs, and I see you nodding your head, so yay, we did a good job. <laughs> um, but now the question becomes, what's the admissions process look like? What are the deadlines and everything else? I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing every single particular item of the admissions application, you have that in this lovely little um, pamphlet that we have put back there and it's going to give you all of the different um, things that we need and that you need to submit in order to have completed um, an application. So academic transcripts from all of the schools and universities that you have attended. 
we will need essays for you to submit, um, delineating a little bit about your personal background, what are your career goals. If you are thinking of going into any of the specializations, you will have to submit an extra essays. We are requiring um, uh, letters of recommendations. Please remember that the letters of recommendation should be from people that have um, supervised your work and have had to give you objective feedback. So it cannot be from a coworker, it cannot be from a friend or a family member. Um, then we're also asking for those of you who are international students, we do need the TOEFL and the ILTS, so you will need to submit that as part of your admissions application. And finally, but not least, a writing test um, for those of you who are applying to the MS um, degree. And as our students were explaining, three open-ended questions, just be aware of the world. Um, just be aware a little bit of history and then there's a freestyle piece. If you're anything like me, you think of the word test and it and I just freeze for the first 20 minutes, I stare at it. Um, don't feel that way with our test, please don't. Um, do your due diligence, do pay attention to what's going on in the world, but know that that is one piece of the admissions process, not the end and be all. Deadlines are in December for the um, PhD and the MS degree, December 15. For those that are interested in the MA, it's January 5th. And for those who are interested in the dual degree with engineering, that will be January 15th. If you have submitted all of your materials on time and we have everything that we need, um, we will be sending out um, admissions decisions in the middle of March. So everything happens very quickly. Um, for those of you that submit all of the financial aid requirements, which I'll go over um, just right now as well, you will also will be receiving that award letter at the same time that you receive that admissions um, offer. In terms of financial aid, I'll start off by saying that you need to do your planning now. Um, it is an investment um, to come here to the J School, not only of your time, your resources, but also financially. Unlike undergraduates, for those of you that have attended here in the U.S. Um, undergraduate school, the federal government doesn't really offer any scholarships or any grants. Um, so what that means is that student loans are a reality. People are borrowing to come here. Um, we do offer scholarship funding that is available whether you are a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or an international student. Um, there's also outside scholarship fundings that you can apply for. Um, these are private organizations, regardless of which school you're thinking or end up going, do yourself the favor of researching those outside scholarship fundings that are out there. We start you off with a listing on our site. Those scholarships that are listed there, um, our students have received them in the past, but that list is not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. So start with your reporting skills and start researching um, how to finance your degree here. Um, if you go to our website, we'll, we'll have a lot more details about that, um, about the financing piece of it. Pay attention to deadlines, please. In order for us to consider you for scholarship funding, you have to submit the scholarship aid application by the deadline, which is usually February 1st. And we will be sending out all of that information and reminding you of it. So with that, I would like to open it now for questions because I'm pretty sure some of you might have questions that you want to ask. No questions. <laughs> okay. Oh, there is one. Hi. Uh, Hi. Can you just uh, talk a little bit about the uh, using GI Bill for, uh, for J School? Yes, absolutely. Um, you will need to, we have actually a dedicated team here at Columbia University who will help you with your GI Bill's benefits and depending on where you fall in the spectrum of it, whether it's the yellow ribbon, whether you can apply for a vocational rehab, which basically covers everything and anything, um, I will give you their contact information, um, their names, or you can search for them on our website. His name is Eric Halperin and Anne-Marie Gesslin. My advice is to reach out to them now and they will be able to tell you exactly what your benefits will be covering when you come here, um, what your monthly stipend might be, and again, if you're able to apply for anything else under the GI Bill. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? 
Okay. Oh, you do. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What are the things that we have to prepare in, in order to qualify for the financial aid for the um, international scholarship? Thank you. For international students, what you're filling out is just the J school application, which will become available um, probably during the first week of December. We will be asking for supporting documentation. So tax returns, if you have filed for them at your, in your home country, if they're in another language, we're expecting you to submit the original one plus a translation. Bank account information as well, you will need to submit for that. Um, for US citizen, we will be requiring the free application for federal student aid. And we're also going to be asking you for the 4506T form, which basically is saying if you're randomly selected for verification, we will be requesting the tax returns from the IRS. For international students, what it will mean is that we will be reviewing those forms and those um, documents that you have submitted. Also, I should note, and I'm, thank you for, the, for that question, um, for international students, remember that you will have to file for visa, uh, for a visa to come here. And when you are filing that doc, those documentations, it is a documentation that you're filing with the Department of Homeland Security here at the United States of America. So make sure that whatever it is that you're listing in that application as the available resources, you have them in hand. Um, again, it is a legal document that you're filing. You have to provide accurate information in there. And this advice goes to international and also for domestic students as well. Do yourself the favor of figuring out your finances before you get here. Um, as you heard from our faculty panel, as you heard from our students, the program goes by so quickly and there's so many demands on your time that the last thing you need to be worrying about is how am I going to be paying for this? How am I going to be paying for my living expenses? Some students will come in and just worry about what the school will be charging you, what the university will be charging for tuition and fees. You have to plan for your living expenses as well. Anybody here um, familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of need, psychology term? Yes? Okay. <laughs> so think of Maslow's, um, I know, right, in an admissions and financial aid, I'm sliding in the psychology, I know. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of need, and one of the things that he mentions are your physiological needs. Um, and without you worrying or you having that covered, you cannot reach self-actualization. And if you put it in this context, it's getting through graduation. It's getting through your academic side. If you're not worrying about this, then you can take advantage of all of that that was mentioned um, without having this big cloud over you. So. Um, financial planning, do it now. If you walk away with anything about this financial aid talk, that is really what I want you to walk away with. You have to start planning now for it. And there are no such thing as you should know. Come to our office, ask us as many questions as you have, work on your budget right now. Um, so yeah, and with that, the next question. Hi, um, I was wondering if you're interested in dual degree programs, um, specifically the business school, which we didn't talk about. Is it possible to be admitted to the J school and then later apply to the business school, or do you have to do both from the beginning? Excellent question. Um, I'll start off by saying that dual degrees here, with the exception of computer science, for those of you who are interested in that, is just one application. For those of you who are interested in the dual degrees um, within the other schools in Columbia, the business school, School of International and Public Affairs, law, you have to submit the application, separate admissions application, to both schools at the same time. So you're going through two different admissions process. We're not going to be calling the business school and saying, are you accepting the student? They're not going to be calling us in the other schools as well. If you're admitted at the same time, and both of us say yes, that's when you're a dual degree student. Some schools will allow you to, if you, don't, if you don't do that at the time of admissions that you're applying to both schools, some of them will allow you to do it during your first semester, but that is something that you should figure out now and find out from the other school if they will allow you to do that. The way that dual degree works, just so, so those of you who might be thinking about it, you will spend your 10 months or your year here, 
um, completely immersed in the journalism program, and then you will be immersed in the other degree programs. So it's not as though you're taking classes here at the J school and at the other school. Again, with the exception of the computer science dual degree. That is a truly dual degree in the traditional term, where you will be taking classes here at the J school and at the School of Engineering. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, hi, it's hi. me again. Mm -hmm. um, is the scholarship also applicable for part-time students or is it just for full-time? That is correct. Scholarship is also for part-time students. We do offer scholarship funding to all of our students, international, mm -hmm. domestic, part-time, full-time, PhD, computer science. You're all considered for it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other question? Asking questions saves a lot of guessing work. Uh, I have a question about journalistic samples for the admissions process. Uh, let's say I have a journalistic-ish type piece from like three years ago. Mm -hmm. Is that something I could use or would you prefer more recent writing samples? I'll turn the question back to you. Um, is that piece reflective of the kind of work that you're able to do today? Some more than others. So more than, then that's your question. If right. you're looking at a piece and you're like, well, you know what? I have evolved and I can see certain things that I should have done differently or that I could have done better, then that's the response. That shouldn't be a piece that you should submit. Usually when I talk about the journalistic pieces, I say, you know what? Think of it as though you're submitting for this huge prize and you're picking the best of the best, and you're saying, you know what, when you look at this pieces that I'm submitting, you're gonna be blown away. You're gonna see the type of work that I'm able to do, and you're going to see the potential in me. So if, as you're going through your samples, as you're putting them together, that's, those are the kind of questions that you should be asking yourself. Okay, cool, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say with the admissions application, pay attention to your essays. Make sure that they're telling you, that they're telling us um, who you are. Um, think of the admissions pieces as though they were pieces of a puzzle and every piece of it is critical. It is important. We will be looking at them and we will be trying to build this puzzle and figure out who this person is and that is you. Um, so any other questions, any other concerns, anything else? No? Okay, so with that said, thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully I'll see you here as a student. It's amazing to see you here, then through the application process, then while you're a student and you're saying, I'm tired, but I'm happy, graduation, and then see you go off and do wonderful, wonderful things. So thank you again, and I'll see you soon. <laughs>